Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining my session. So, quick raise of hands. How many of you work in Python as your daily job? Who's just starting off? Okay, okay, thank you. So, my name is JP Furcht. I work for a credit bureau in South Africa, and I'm what you call an aspiring data scientist. There's a, it's one of those new buzzwords where everyone wants to call themselves a data scientist or data engineer. I do feel that there's a certain criteria that you first need to meet before you can call yourself a proper data scientist. So, in this endeavor, I am a, by at core, a SQL Server professional. I work with data day in, day out. And a couple of months ago, I came across this awesome thing called Python, and everyone is talking about now you have to use Python or R for your machine learning models, and, and, and. And I started looking at it, and t as soon as you start learning a new technology, you go into that habit of becoming what my dad always called a hammer. You see a problem, and because you're the hammer, every problem is a nail. So now you try to solve every problem with Python. So by no means is Python the start or end of your solution because certain things in your SQL environment, your NoSQL environment, do handle data much better than what you can do in Python. But saying that, because you go outside of your normal row-based, uh, set-based operations, in Python you move closer to your row-based operations and your vectors, you do get string manipulation and certain functions to perform a lot better in Python. So you can stop me at any time if you have a question. Uh, it's just I've never done this talk in 30 minutes, so let's see how good we do this. Uh, first off is let's start off with the different IDEs. So most of you would be um, quite familiar with either PyCharm or um, VS Code, my favorite, VS Visual Studio Code, because it's so diverse. And there's Microsoft stuff sitting into the session, so I just want to boost, boost my own little credit a little bit. Then um, you're part of Anacondas. If you install Anacondas, a nice little environment where you can work, wi uh, work with most of these data science tools and libraries that comes pre-installed. If you are looking at working with some of the data science technologies and data engineering technologies like Psychic Learn and those things, I would highly recommend, if you want to ro run it on your local machine, to run in, uh, it through Anacondas. The reason being is Anacondas get shipped with a library called MKL, which is a optimized engine, Intel engine, for a lot of these models. It just makes things run so much faster. Today we're going to focus most of our work in Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks. So just to show you a quick, very, very quick demo, is this entire presentation that you are looking at now is done in Jupyter Notebooks. This is, if I close this, there's an add-on that was had, that I installed as part of Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks is a very, in my mind, the way I see it, it is a very advanced text document. You can store markup language, you can store pictures, you can run your code, you can code in it, and your output gets to display in Jupyter. So how many people have worked in Jupyter here before? Quite a few. So in Jupyter, you get this, uh, there's a presentation mode, which you can set it into, where you can afterwards, there's a little command line that you run, Jupyter, convert, NB, convert, and it converts your entire notebook into a HTML uh, uh, file, which you can use to present off. Or if you use RISE, another f uh, function that you can install, you get this nice little interactive um, presentation mode. Now the beauty of this is, so let's get started. And first off is let's import our libraries that we're going to work with today. So we're going to work with pandas, because that is essentially where we're going with this. And I'm also importing two additional libraries, matplotlib and seaborn, that's just to make my data look pretty. Because there's no point in showing you a presentation with a lot of numbers, all of you will fall asleep, and I don't want that. So, as I showed earlier, I feel this is truly magical. In my presentation, I've just executed code in RISE. That is life-changing. That is. So now you can build your presentations, you can talk to business, you can talk to analysts, you can... Uh, and halfway through this talk, you might come up and ask me, how do you join data? I can do that while I'm in my presentation mode still. Then, 
So I've installed Pandas, which will be my library of choice where I want to work with my data. It gives me the ability to transform, manipulate, and do quite a lot of functionality with my data closer to um, the way I understand data in a set-based. Where I, if I bring it down to row-based, it's uh, taking it. Uh, I'm getting less comfortable with how to work with my data. So, what does Pandas do? Pandas insert your data into a thing called a data frame. So data frame is quite easily a two-dimensional size mutable, potentially heterogeneous uh, tabular data structure. Easy? Everyone understand that? Don't lie. <laughs> um, essentially, it is a table. In your SQL or your data structures, it is a table. You have columns, you have rows, you have data. Uh, each column is assigned a, uh, some metadata to assign uh, to tell you what data types is in your data. It is a table. And from this point forward, I'm going to try and relate it a little bit more to the data professional world. So if you work with data quite a lot, you will, uh, I'm going to refer to as a data frame as a table. So just so that you don't get confused. But in the same instance, I'm also going to call my table a data frame so that I don't confuse myself. So first off, let's start with importing data in the fro uh, into a data frame from a CSV. Now I found this fantastic feature because in pandas you can just uh, specify pandas dot read CSV and you give it a CSV file and if it is a clean CSV clean data which we don't get quite often that doesn't really exist but it just imports it into a data frame. No, no further configurations needed. If you are like me and by accident left your computer unlocked one day at, at the office and one of your employees decided to um, go and mess around with your regional settings and no one knows what they changed, I now need to specify what's my separate and decimal every time I try to import a CSV. But that was on me. But if you look closely at what's happening here is I have a data set called the PGA Data Historical Data Set. It is a CSV that I've downloaded from Kaggle. So if you want to start playing in Jupyter Notebooks and you don't want to install anything on your machine, I would highly recommend, uh, recommend going to Kaggle. It is a, vo a very big repository of open data sets. And part of it, it also runs on a Python kernel or more Spark type of kernel where you can select a data set, click and open new notebook, and you have this notebook immediately to start working with that data set. It is that you don't have to download anything, you don't have to install any applications, you're good to just start off and playing with data and learn, teach yourself. But if you look closely, I've, uh, 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 my import CSV is a .zip file. So it, by auto by just by virtue of being a zip file, it automatically picks up that it now needs to read a binary file and not a text file, and it just works. Just telling it read CSV, uh, and it works. So you can see it's busy running, that little star on the left-hand side said it's running, and they had imported 2.7 million records, five columns long, in a few seconds. Now it's not big data, I think it's like 400 megs or 300 megs this data set, so it's not that impressive that it does it in two seconds, but I still feel uh, it's quite nice. One thing that you do need to take uh, ke keep into consideration is everything is in memory. So when you think about that, if it, ca it can't fit it into memory, the data frame, it just throws you an error. And if you run this on your local machine, I've got, what, 32 gigs of memory on this thing, which is more than enough for most of the things. But working with large credit data, m the majority of my files is two, 300 gigs big. I can't import that into a data frame uh, on my machine. Unfortunately enough, the service that was given to me at my office does uh, can support that, but my machine cannot do that. So you can specify, bring only in the columns that I need. So you don't need to import a, a file with 14,000 columns. You only want two columns of it. So specify what you want to limit your memory usage. Or just keep that part in mind. So now that we have our data in a data frame, uh, in Jupyter Notebooks, how do you look at it? The traditional Python way is when you start looking and at your data or looking at what your code is doing, is you can print it. So I can tell my data frame dot print, and it prints out my data frame. So data frame has a head and a tail function originated from the Unix commands. So it is head n 
or tail end, so the number you put in there, that's the amount of records that it would return back for you. As you can see, uh, but because we're in Jupyter Notebooks, it knows how to interpret what you want it to return. I, c I do not have to print my objects. I can just call majority of my objects directly. Uh, in this instance, I'm just telling it my data frame, return the first three records, and it returns it in this nice little table structure. The resolution is quite terrible. Sorry about that. Then, so now essentially if you think of back into the data world, what we've done now is we've done a select star. Select star from my table. Now, f me coming from a database world, it's a constant fight trying to get developers to not do a select star, just to just select what you need because you're hurting my database. But uh, uh, the other day, someone showed me a nice little trick. You just point all, all, your, all the developers to views, and in your view, you add a calculated column, say one divide by zero, so a select star can't be done on that table. It's a brilliant solution. You have to specify the columns. Um, so now let's select only for certain columns. In a data f in pandas, you have a data frame, which is your last level object, and each row or instance of uh, the data is specified as a series. It's essentially a little bit more advanced mutable vector that came from NumPy. So if I want to return just one specific column, I can do that square bracket notation. So I can call my table or my data frame, call my column, and it returns that as a series. But not always, you, uh, well, not in every instance do you want to work with series. You want to keep it in a data frame format. So what you can do is the double square notation. So you pass it uh, that list or that single object in the double square bracket notation, and it will return your data and keep the uh, type object that you're returning as a data frame. So the top one is returning a series, bottom one is returning a uh, data frame object. You also have the ability to do a the dot notation, so you can call my table dot my column, and that would return a series as well for you in uh, when working with your data. One thing to uh, keep in mind is, uh, if you see, I have a look there, I have a column called player space name. So the dot notation, Python has threw that column completely away for use in the dot notation, because it can't interpret what to do with that. So that's when we go to the next steps, what I like to call our DDL modifications. So in the SQL world, your DDL modifications, changing your table name, changing your metadata, adding, removing columns. So this is still not working with the data. It's working with the metadata of, <laughs> metadata of your data. So let's start off with renaming columns. If you, uh, uh, the last column in my mm, uh, data frame is called value. And if I, ex if I want to change that column, I just call the dot rename function. I tell it to rename my columns from uh, the dictionary value to distance and return that. Now, what I've done there is I've told it essentially do my select my value as distance. So this is just bringing the data back with a different name. This is not uh, persisting the change to the data set. So to persist the change, you have to specify the, uh, so the, here's an example. If I call this immediately after I've done that whole rename, the, my last column is back to value because this only returned it in that instance as distance. It didn't persist it. If you want to persist it, you either have to specify a parameter for the rename, and most of the functions in pandas have this parameter, where you can specify in place true, to say replace my uh, object with this new object that I want with the new modifications that I've made, or you can do the uh, create a new object from the previous object with the exact same name. Any questions so far? Smart bunch. Um, yeah, so now let's alter a few data types. So let's start off. If I look at my data types, there's a function called dtypes. So I can call my data frame and ask it, show me all the data types in my uh, data. You'll see there there's a function, it returns my five columns and my five data types. In uh, pandas, the type object is the same as a string. It is a string uh, object, and int is numbers. So there's there's a diff couple of different um, data types that we can work with there. So I want to go and change my distance because I know my distance is a numeric field. Uh, this is the PGA data set. This is the number of yards uh, or the distance in yards, how far the each player has hit the ball. 
and I know that should be a numeric because at this point I cannot do any proper aggregation or any mathematical uh, anything to it. So to do that, I call my distance, just a little bit unfortunate, I called my data frame distance and my column distance, not a very good practice. Uh, and uh, I just tell it apply, and with your apply function, you can also apply lambda functions on the fly onto e any column you want in a data fr a frame. So I just apply it and I tell it change that column to numeric and then uh, return it the data types of my uh, data frame again, and you'll see the distance has been changed to a float 64. So I showed you how to rename a column, and uh, if you looked closely at the previous way of how I renamed my columns, I specified a little dictionary of saying my two column from column, two column from column. So using a little, if you want to rename multiple columns, you can do the exact same format you did earlier, just by specifying more columns at once. You don't have to do it line by line, just to get it all out of the way immediately. How to drop data, or uh, drop columns. It is as simple as my data frame dot drop, give it a column, and this is where things get a little bit confusing. If uh, uh, in Pandas you have this whole concept of your axis, and your zero axis is your rows, and your x, uh, your, your zero axis is your rows, and your one axis is your x axis, which is your columns. And if I just run this drop statement statistic, it's going to f look for a column with an index called statistic to drop it, which doesn't exist. So I need to tell my drop statement, go to axis one and look for a column called statistic, not a row of index statistic. And then again, in place true, otherwise it just does it for this object that I'm returning at the moment. Then sorting your data is as simple as giving the sort a sort function and telling it to sort by what, and it will sort by this. This takes quite a, quite a long time because I'm assuming it's a lot of data and my machine might not be good enough to do that. Now let's get into a little bit of data slicing. This is where the fun starts. So when you are trying to build any model, any data engineering project, starting with a you can expect that 80%, 80 to 90% of your time is going to go uh, into working with your data, cleaning your data before you even get to the model. The model is the easy part. Getting the data into a readable format and a proper format, that takes time. And un understanding which features to select, that takes time. The model is really the easy part. You can do a machine learning model in five lines if you understand what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> But uh, getting the feature selection, the maths behind all that, that is where things get a little bit tricky. So let's say, uh, so what I'm doing here is, as soon as I return a uh, any object as a series, I expose the NumPy functions to that. So I can do, on my series, unique. So I'm asking for my table, select my season and return a list of unique uh, seri uh, seasons. You can see I have data from 2010 all the way up to 2018 in my data set. So now with that knowledge, I can also just, okay, just to show you, you can also do that square bracket to return the series in that instance as well, and then you still have access to all those uh, functions. If I try to do the dot .unique on the above line where I return it as a data frame object, it will throw me an error and say there is no dot .unique for data frame object. You need to uh, mute it into a series object. So now let's uh, locating data. So you get the lock and I lock functions of a data frame. Lock is you locate data based on actual columns, and I lock is you locate data based on indexes. So every data frame has a um, determined index. If you don't specify index, it will start with uh, running a zero-based index from zero till the end of how many records there is. You also have the ability to specify your own index if you're working with South African data and you want your index to be ID, so you want to join it to a separate data frame that you're working with. So the lock function is quite nice. So it locates data based on columns, like I said, so you have a notation of the, the same way what you would do with arrays. You have your square bracket and you're starting an end position and, you, and then you can comma, a place a comma and then give a list of columns that it needs to return. Here you see I told it to bring back all my records from the start to end and only return season and players and then at the end I do the count into it a thing to say 
but only show me the first five, which I could have done by uh, using that first thing. And you can also, when you specify only one record, it doesn't return a data frame object. It will return a series object. So just look out for that when you're working with it. Where I lock starts with also the from row to row, but now this, the from column to column, is indexed based. So if I say from column one, it skips the first column because the first column has an index of zero, which you'll see in my example uh, yeah, I'm telling it to return all the columns, comma, bring me from column one till the end of my column. At any given time, you can do the same what you would do with any vector or any array. You can go with your minus. You can say, start at record minus nine to the end. So it's looking at the last, the ninth last record and go to the end of my data set. This is especially useful when you try to uh, uh, create different windows and different aggregations of your data. So, how do we filter data? First thing is, uh, mo most of you work in Python apparently daily, and you have a Boolean operation, uh, or a comparison operation, and an assignment operation. So, what you do is, uh, uh, to start filtering your data, you use your comparison operators. You just say, my data frame, my player name, return that as a series, and only return where equal, where true, or to any else. So I'm trying to build a data frame containing any data where the player name is any else. And then just bringing back the entire data frame. So the double square bracket notation, you'll just see it's now a little bit more nested. So this will return back a data frame consisting only of data for any else. Do you everyone understand that part? Yes, yes. Okay, so how do we query the data a little bit more? So now I've showed you how to do an equals uh, or comparison operation. That's not what we always want to do, and it can get very complicated if you have and, 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 and those kinds of things. So what uh, you have a on your data frame an is in function, where it's essentially just in. So where my variable, so I have a column called variable, is in driving distance average and driving distance total drives, with separated of columns, so it will return my data set uh, where those two are true. I can also do the same with any other column that I want to. So now getting it a little bit closer to home again, uh, back into a SQL environment, because I like to keep stuff, my two, uh, all my different environments that I work in, quite easily to read and easy to understand. And you have this, uh, for a data frame, you have a query function. And essentially, in if you write SQL code quite often, it's your where clause. You say query variable equals my driving distance. Now I'm returning a data frame, so immediately I can do another query on that. But this seems very confusing because I can have query this, dot query, dot query, dot query, it can go on forever. <laughs> so just to do a little bit closer to what I would like to keep my code readable, I can do my dot query variable equals driving distance and my distance is greater than 315 yards. So in there, you can start with your uh, comparison logic in your dot .query function. So manipulating data is quite easy. So if I, I know for a fact on record 2.1 million, it is Rory McIlroy's driving distance for 2017, the, uh, the one of the world record holders for uh, with distance in golf. And we were informed that his distance was wrong. So we need to now go and update that record uh, because some, uh, some data capture captured it wrong in the rare instance because we all know data captures never makes a mistake. So it is as e easy as locating that record and assigning it to a new value. The data is updated. If I call it again, then you can see I've updated that record of Rory McIlroy to 318.8 yards. Okay, adding a new column, it is as simple as specifying or referencing a column that you have not yet created or doesn't exist. So here I created a quick column for uh, in the player's data frame called draw, and I'm just assigning it a random number between 5 and 120 to see who wins my prize. And you'll see there it added a column draw onto my data frame. 
Now that we have all the data we wanted, we fixed it, we cleaned it, we've removed everything we didn't want to, we've added everything that we ne didn't need or needed and didn't need, now we can start with working with this data. So first off is if you want to just get a the maximum distance that each one of my players uh, drove a ball in the PGA Tour. Uh, across the 10 seasons. You can do data frame dot group by my player names and then just call the max function on my distance. And it does a quick aggregation for you on this. So now, exercise time. This is where we jump up, up and down. Everyone looks asleep. So let's start with the cool, pretty stuff. Pretty graphs. So earlier you showed I've, uh, I showed you I've imported matplotlib and Seaborn, and uh, so Seaborn is just a library built on top of matplotlib. Both of them are graphing uh, uh, or plotting libraries, and Seaborn just makes your graphs look a little bit more prettier, a little bit more presentable. But matplotlib is essentially its um, backbone, which it was built off. So. How do you build in your data uh, in your Jupyter notebooks? You can add your graphs and make all your little uh, visualizations available to management when you start to present your findings. What I've done here is it's a little bit cut off, but this is just one line where I've returned my data frame. I'm just uh, filtering, just bring me back the driving distance, and I can call dot plot function and if I just call the dot plot function and stop it there it will plot a bar chart for me on that data. I didn't want a bar chart because for some miracle this data set is one of the most natural distributions that I've seen so I've plotted it as a histogram just to show that there is perfect data out there. You can also, uh, uh, what I've done here is I've created a quick data frame just containing all the information of Rory McElroy. And what I've uh, uh, and there I've set Seaborn to just change the figure size just so that you guys can see. Otherwise, it's this big by default. So there's a lot of parameters you can pass through to these plotting libraries to change the way it works. And at the very end, all I'm doing is calling my data frame, saying plot, make it a line chart, and just to show you there's more information that you can give it and more parameters that you can pass. I've added a title average distance and made my x axis the seasons. And you'll, here you'll see year on year Rory McElroy's um, average distance and you'll see in 2013 there's a little dip and I think I read somewhere that he had a mental breakdown in that season so I'm assuming that's why that happened because I couldn't understand why he would just go down backwards in your career like that. And you can also do multiple graphs because we are on Python. You can iterate through your data set. You can uh, create loops on different data sets. And what I've done is I took my data set and I'm just looping through all the columns that I have to give me a little bit of statistical information on what the data is I'm working with. Just to show for my driving distance average, what's my max, my min, my uh, 25th and 75th percentile, and my mean of each one of those columns. Now, this looks nice. This is easy to explain when you're talking to uh, someone in management, but when you're talking to a statistician or something, this, uh, that looks very pretty. Where's the actual raw data? And that is as simple as passing a dot .describe function to your data frame, and it will output this bottom uh, grid here, which is essentially the plot graph just with the actual numbers. Now, now we've done most of our analysis, we've changed our data, we've you know, plotted everything, now we understand what we worked with, we cleaned it, and you've gone on and did some wonderful thing to your, uh, wonderful stuff to your data. Now, how do I get this out of Python? Now, one thing is you, uh, you can either push it directly back into SQL, or you can export it to a, a CSV, and it is as simple as that, to export it to CSV. I take my data frame, I tell it to CSV, and I give it a name. Then it creates a CSV of my entire data set on disk in my working directory. Doing that for SQL, to move it to a SQL instance, you first have to um, import a few extra libraries, so you pipe ODBC, create a connection string, and then essentially at the very bottom you still take my data frame to SQL, give it a table name, and tell it what's my connection string, and it inserts it into SQL. 
If anyone has a very, very nice way of moving data back into SQL from Python, please come talk to me afterwards, because I have not found a nice way of effectively moving data back into SQL. I, I prefer to export to CSV and let uh, a technology like DTS or BCP take care of it, because it's just much better at using, doing bulk operations. So, any questions? Yes. Yes, you can do that. You can write your, if there's a, if you can create your connection, same, there's a function from SQL, and you just write your query, specify your instance, or your engine. Yes. Uh, we wrote a Spark SQL connector. Yes. For you to write it to SQL, which is, uses the bulk insert recorder underneath it, which is extremely fast. Okay, so there is a library that we can import. The Spark SQL Connector, if anyone wants to take note. Didn't know. Thank you, Donovan. Yeah, to answer your question, to write back to the SQL Server, we tried Spark SQL Connector with Scala, and which supports, by the way, um, in batch and incremental way to write that. Uh, also, it supports, uh, supports uh, table lock, if you want to have and create the batch. Uh, but with with pandas and numpy, it will insert row by row. It yeah, that's won't terrible. be able to do. But <laughs> other way is to use the utility of the Spark, uh, sorry, um, of SQL Server to stream that in a from CSV to uh, from t CSV to table way. So what I pr uh, what I like to do is what I found is in SQL I think from SQL 2017 onwards they've included the uh, machine learning launcher inside of SQL, so I can execute Python uh, Python code from within the SQL engine, and uh, in there there's an easy way of passing my table into the Python doing all my manipulations and then let SQL take care of getting it back out of that. And that is also very efficient. Correct. But if you work on big solutions like this, you first, it takes time to develop it. Yeah. Is that it? Thank you. Oh, sorry. How do you manage multiple, like, um, most of the data we've seen so far is 2D based. What happens if you have, like, any dimensional data, like uh, if you're working with extremely compl complex data sets, how does, um, what's the best approach? So in a nice way you're saying working with data where no one took the time to define the layout, the schema. Okay, so what you would do is uh, in the uh, data frame is a two-dimensional uh, two size mutable object. If you are working in that instance, you would m more work with your numpy, numpy vectors or working with TensorFlow vectors um, that can take care of multidimensional data much uh, easier. This is a two-dimensional solution on that. Thank you. Yes. Quick, quick question. Uh, this is a newbie question. Um, I've used Jupyter a little bit, and I was following now, and I know for a fact I haven't actually used pip to install all of this stuff, and I just imported it, and it everything just worked. Does Jupyter do that for you? Actually, um, it comes part of uh, the Anaconda uh, that okay. I've installed. That Most of these libraries uh, get shipped as part of Anaconda. Okay, so it's because I have Anaconda that yes. it all just works. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you, everyone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to think how I'm going to ask this. Um, how do you handle opening large CSV files? So say for instance, a one gig CSV file. How do you handle opening that? Because obviously it's going to take a lot of computational power. To be fair, one gig is not big. It, it will take it a few, it, it will take, take maybe five minutes uh, to import a one gig CSV the, uh, into a pandas data frame. Okay, how about this? There's a library that you can use called Modern. It uh, really, um, improves the performance of you loading data sets, so you can look at it. Modern. Yeah. Thank Modern. you very much. M-O-D-I-N. It, it just wraps around pandas. Yes. So um, say, for instance, because uh, I work with large CSV files, it usually takes me like uh, 40 to 50 seconds just to open one gig CSV file. 
but with just normal pandas, it should it will probably take you like we four said, five, five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then you thank you very it. much for that tip. And as I said earlier, if you're working through Anaconda, there's also Miniconda that comes shipped with a lot less libraries, but it's still uh, installed with that base MKL. It does ha add a very big performance improvement on everything that you want to do in that Python environment uh, working with Anaconda. Okay, thank Great. you. <laughs> thank you, everyone.